Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dana Corson, a media officer with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Thank you for joining us for a webinar on the report that was just released titled Strengthening the Disaster Resilience of the Academic Biomedical Research Community, Protecting the Nation's Investment. You can now download a copy of the report and other supporting materials at www.nationalacademies.org forward slash disaster resilient labs. And you can follow the conversation about the report on social media at hashtag disaster resilient labs. For those of you not familiar with the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are private nonprofit institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. The academies operate under a congressional charter to the National Academy of Sciences that was signed by President Lincoln in 1863. For each requested study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience and serve pro bono to carry out the study's statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee and must undergo external peer review before they are released, as did this report. I have with me several members of the committee to discuss the report's findings and recommendations. But before I introduce them, I would like to go over a few technical reminders. After the opening remarks, we will begin to take questions through the Q&A box located in the right, lower right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type your question in the box at any time and click Submit. We ask that you leave the box set to send your questions to all panelists and that you identify yourself and your organization when asking a question. And if you have any technical issues during the webinar, please contact WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3200. Now I'd like to introduce the members of the committee who are here with us today. We have Dr. Georges Benjamin, who is the chair of the committee and the executive director at the American Public Health Association. We have Dr. Alexander Izakoff. He's the executive director in the Office of Critical Event Preparedness and Response at Emory University. We have Kirk Pawlowski, who is an architect and planner based in Portland, Oregon. We have Dr. John Rock, who is founding dean and senior vice president for health affairs at the Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine at Florida International University. And we have Dr. Katherine Vogelwide, clinical professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Missouri. So we'll start off with a presentation summarizing the report, and then we'll open it up for questions you may have. Please note that this briefing is scheduled to last one hour unless we run out of questions beforehand. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Benjamin. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I want to just thank you for being here today to um, talk with us and hear about the disaster resilience of academic biomedical research communities. Um, let me start um, by bringing up um, just a list of the committee. You can see there are, there are 13 committee members there. Um, this is a, a wide um, um, breadth of expertise around um, preparedness, um, leadership, and um, um, engineering that met for over a year um, to really look at the issues here and bring us this report. Um, I'd also like to take a moment just also to thank our study sponsors. You can see there we had four sponsors who sponsored this study. Um, and again, just thank them for their foresight in thinking about this very important issue. The committee was charged with looking at uh, several things. Number one, um, describing the extent of the impact of prior disasters on the academic research community 
and with a big focus on the biomedical aspects of, of those communities. We were asked to provide guidance for individual researchers, research institutions, and the sponsors regarding actions that they might take to mitigate the impact of further disasters. And specifically, we were asked to look at the challenges of what's happened in the past and to then look forward and see what might potentially happen in the future. As you know, the, the science around preparedness is really around planning and mitigation. So a lot of the report is designed to think about how best we can um, create a situation um, which ultimately we all call resilience so that when a disaster strikes, an academic research center can get back to normality as quickly as possible. We also wanted to put um, some report, um, some um, key terminology in the report. There's a, there's a long list of terminology in that report, but there's some important ones that we just wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, number one, we think of the academic biomedical research community in the broadest sense of all of those aspects of the of the um, enterprise that can um, um, that support the academic research um, endeavor. Um, we also tried not to reinvent the wheel. So you'll see that our definition for disaster and resilient are very consistent with existing definitions that are already in, um, in common use. So let me also then talk a bit about the background of this study. Um, you know, the, um, we spend over uh, $67 billion, $27 billion uh, each year. Um, annually in research in the biomedical field. And that's an enormous investment that needs to be protected. And recognizing it's a large amount of money and the value that research brings to our society, um, and the fact that we are increasingly having more and more um, emergent events occurring, uh, whether it is um, uh, Superstorm Sandy that we saw or tragically Hurricane Katrina, or, or even the flooding now that we're, we're seeing in New Orleans, um, tornadoes and hurricanes that we're hearing more and more about each and every day, there's an urgency to our work. And so the committee, as they did their work, thought a bit about what has happened in the past and, again, thought looking forward around some of the things that we may need to do um, to address this in the future. We also looked um, very specifically at the impact on certain groups um, within the system. Um, so the first one, of course, was the human as um, aspects of the impact on the research faculty, staff, and students, uh, recognizing that it's not just about their safety and well-being um, before and, and during the disaster, but also their uh, well-being after the disaster and what the impact is from a psychological aspect, from an employment aspect, um, and ultimately their careers. Uh, imagine being a young um, student who has now spent two years working on their thesis and suddenly disaster strikes and you lose all of your research. Uh, what does that really do to your career um, going forward? We talked a great deal about the, the impact on academic research institutions, obviously on the, the physical aspect of those, those institutions. We talked a great deal about the, the sponsors, um, what it means about redirecting their research and moving forward. Um, and ultimately the impact um, to the nation, um, the community that, it, that it surrounds it, recognizing that a lot of academic research communities are indeed the major employer in town, uh, and ultimately the science, which is why um, academic research communities do what they do. So this is a graphic that you will see um, in the report, and the intent of this graphic is just to show um, a kind of a summary of how we think of, we thought about this problem, uh, recognizing that, uh, again, what we wanted to focus on was the research sponsor, the institution themselves, and the individuals involved. And at the end of the day, our report is hopefully designed um, to give a pathway forward to ensure that those institutions can be more resilient with the idea of protecting human life, the research um, animals, property in the environment, and at the end of the day, uh, maintain the integrity and continuity of the research. So with that overview, uh, I'm going to turn it over to um, 
um, Dr. John Rock to talk a bit about the role of institutional uh, research um, leadership. Uh, thank you, Georges. Uh, in this report, the committee uh, recognized that individuals at all levels play a role in disaster resilience, from research students to university presidents and governing bodies. Leadership plays a big role in how an institution prioritizes resilience and how resources and support for resilience are designated. The next slide, please. The committee's first recommendation is to designate uh, a qualified senior of it, the individual with oversight of disaster resilience efforts for the research enterprise. And it came from an understanding that support for disaster resilience planning has to come from the highest levels of leadership within the academic research institution. This individual who we've called the Chief Resilience Officer or the CRO should be someone with a clear understanding of the research enterprise, someone who can represent the interest of researchers and sponsors in order to build a resilient system in an institution. The establishment of the Chief Resilience Officer depends on the physical and administrative realities of the institution. So uh, this function could be filled by an existing or a new position. Also, the Chief Resilience Officer function does not replace the absolutely necessary work that the emergency management system does or the emergency management program does at the institution. Instead, the Chief Resilience Officer should be integrated into the organizational framework so that he or she can work with emergency management and disaster planning efforts that will prepare the institution and the research enterprise for potential disasters. The organizational structure shown here is an example of how the Chief Resilience Officer can be integrated into the institution and how that position can and should work in concert with emergency medicine. This organizational structure will vary by institution and will likely change in the event of an actual disaster when the incident command system takes over. Next slide, please. The committee's second recommendation is to implement comprehensive integrative disaster resilience planning efforts for the research enterprise that are aligned with the planning at the local, state, and national level. These planning efforts can be spearheaded by the chief resilience officer who should lead the research enterprise planning committee. The research uh, uh, enterprise planning committee or ERC, should work with the community and uh, be a, a wide ranging planning program. Uh, the coordination between these two committees is extremely important. The institute wide, institute, institution wide planning committee may actually have members of the community and uh, which would really promote that integration. Together they work to evaluate the characteristics of the research enterprise, determine goals and objectives for resilience and develop a family of strategic, operational and tactical level plans for uh, disaster resilience. So I'm going to pass uh, the presentation to Alex Isikoff. Thanks very much, John. So anyone on the call or, or thinking about disaster resilience for the academic research enterprise is appreciating, I'm sure, that this is a uh, complex topic uh, and involves uh, many departments uh, across the institution, many individuals across the institution. It requires um, engagement of uh, local, state, and national uh, partners. And so uh, the committee considered the complexity of building disaster resilience for the academic research institution and uh, determined that the best way to convey uh, the evidence base that they had collected over the last year um, and the best practices that we learned from certain uh, uh, presenters and institutions was to, was to convey this information uh, by adopting the National Preparedness System Framework uh, that's uh, developed uh, by the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Management Agency so that we have a common vernacular about um, the uh, topics that we need to discuss, explore, um, and implement to have a disaster resilient community. Uh, 
so the emergency management community is probably most familiar with uh, the national preparedness system. So might uh, public health preparedness um, officials. But this is really the framework by which the whole of community um, is, is looking and is encouraged to look at its own disaster resilience and steps that it takes to try and implement that. Um, there are different mission areas that are described in the National Preparedness Framework, uh, prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. Um, and uh, this National Preparedness System is used by local, state, and federal agencies, as well as in the private sector, uh, to organize um, activities as it relates to um, improving disaster resilience. And it's key for ac the academic research community to adopt the same framework and the same language that's used by local, state, federal agencies, and others in the private sector, because as everyone I'm sure will agree, academic research institutions cannot uh, achieve a level of disaster resilience without engagement of those local, state, and federal partners. And those community partnerships are key, and in fact, it's an explicit recommendation of the report um, to develop, enhance, and leverage local, state, national, federal partnerships, um, and it's through the implementation of uh, uh, the national preparedness system and its uh, mission areas that this is achieved. So to briefly describe uh, some of these mission areas, I think is important because if, if anyone in an academic research institution were to simply uh, grab the national preparedness system and the plans associated with them you know, directly from the FEMA website, I'll, I'll argue from experience that it, it's not always immediately translatable uh, to what we do in an academic research institution. And so the committee was cognizant of that, and a good part of the report actually describes a number of the elements of these um, mission areas um, as they relate to the academic mission, uh, the academic research enterprise. And so some of those, uh, as described before, um, in these different mission areas, let's just touch on them briefly. Prevention, for example. Prevention has a specific definition in this context, and it's, it, it is the capabilities that are necessary to avoid, prevent, or stop a threatened or actual act of terrorism. So what that means for academic uh, research uh, institutions is engagement with uh, local and state and sometimes federal law enforcement agencies so that they have an improved situational awareness about what the risks are in their own community. And this is important because uh, academic research institutions are often housing uh, very sensitive uh, materials, whether they be chemical, biological, or radiological. And having some situational awareness about those risks and taking steps to prevent um, any nefarious access to those materials um, is important and can only be done through information sharing and operational coordination with uh, various law enforcement agencies. Protection is the capabilities necessary to secure against acts of terrorism and man-made or natural disaster. And that includes information exchange by engagement of community coordinating structures like an emergency uh, planning board or other local community groups that are um, uh, that are charged with disaster resilience in the community. Um, also, uh, strategies to manage cybersecurity risks, uh, strategies to preserve data, uh, controlling admittance to critical locations and systems of the academic uh, research facility, um, as well as uh, physical protective measures, and maybe importantly also training uh, and education for uh, the workforce at the academic research institution in such a way that it's rendered resilient. Mitigation strategies include hazard and vulnerability analysis, enterprise risk management, which is a strategy by which process owners um, that are very close to the work that's done at the academic research uh, enterprise have an opportunity to present to leadership, um, executive leadership, so those barriers are, are torn down, and there's a great understanding with the highest leadership of the institution what's necessary to improve its uh, disaster mitigation. And of course, business continuity planning, but not just for the essential functions of the institution to conduct day-to-day -day operations, but business continuity planning that addresses the uh, functions and uh, resilience of the academic uh, research enterprise. Lastly are issues uh, as they relate to, um, uh, I'm having trouble advancing my slide, uh, response and recovery. Uh, and response, of course, is the, adop uh, the adoption of emergency operations plans, the incident command structure, and ability to, to uh, engage in crisis communications and ensure that essential functions are being tended to by uh, personnel um, and uh, uh, last of all, recovery, which are the capabilities that are necessary to restore and rebuild following a disaster, 
And I'll say that this is an area that can take uh, weeks, months, or years, and will require additionally the uh, attention of the leadership to ensure that the appropriate authorities are in place, that the appropriate financial models in place, and the processes are in place to assess damage, work with state and federal partners to restore the institution so it can continue its research mission. And with that, I'm going to transition back to Dr. Rock uh, for his continued comments on the area. Thank you, Alex. Uh, now we're addressing the role of the individual researcher. Uh, in addition to institutional uh, leadership, individual researchers play a pivotal role in disaster resilience. If I could have that next slide, please. The committee's fourth recommendation uh, states that uh, PI should work that is, principal investigators should work with uh, institutions to safeguard and preserve uh, critical research data, samples and reagents. Uh, it came from the understanding that uh, PIs are the most knowledgeable about the critical functions within their labs and that they are invaluable in instituting and maintaining the culture of compliance and safe work practices that are so important to disaster resilience. PIs have the uh, incentive to do this because years of work in data and samples can be lost very quickly in a disaster if they're not properly safeguarded. More importantly, having policies and procedures that ensure laboratory safety can be critical in protecting human life and PIs are on the front lines of making those policies or making sure those policies and procedures are uh, in place and observed. PIs can use something uh, like this sample, as you see on the slide, a sample uh, lab uh, resilience assessment to help develop business continuity procedures that are actionable and lab specific and that protect critical documents, data, sample, reagents, and equipment. Uh, these procedures may include things like uh, conducting a regular inventory of supplies and services, developing relationships with peer institutions, and cryopreserving transgen transgenic lines. Next slide, please. The committee's fifth recommendation is for institutions to implement mandatory, and I stress mandatory, disaster resilience education and training programs for research students, staff, and faculty. These programs should be integrated with other training programs on safety, ethics, and compliance. Personal preparation is key in a response to disaster, and new researchers should be educated in what their individual roles are in the event of a, of a disaster. Researchers who recognize the importance of compliance with resilience protocols can minimize the effects of disasters. Institutions can also consider involving research students in their required training. Students who can bring new perspectives and enthusiasm and can generate the same enthusiasm for disaster resilience in their peers and across the institution. Academic research institutions may also want to consider training key institutional responders in the incident command system. This can improve their ability to communicate with emergency first responders outside the institution. So now I'd like to pass the presentation to Catherine Vogelweide. Thank you, Dr. Rock. Uh, the committee looked at animal research and research animal care in, during disasters in pretty significant detail. Next slide, please. The committee felt that we have an ethical imperative to improve the care of animals during disasters uh, for a couple of reasons. First, and mainly because these animals cannot voluntary, voluntarily evacuate to save themselves. Um, they are totally dependent on humans for their care. And a second important reason is that when we save animals, we're also saving people because the behavior of humans is definitely uh, affected by the presence of animals in a disaster impact area. Our current guidelines for disaster planning are based on the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals, and the recommendations there focus heavily on response and a little bit on the mitigation phase of planning, but the areas of prevention, preparation, and recovery are not included in the current recommendations. 
Uh, the third uh, thing we thought was important was that several of our regulatory agencies, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare, collect information on uh, events that compromise animal welfare and mortality on a continuous basis, but that information isn't shared with the research community. And so we thought that by compiling and sharing this information that we might be able to develop uh, best practices and mitigate common planning area errors that would, and then we could improve our plans overall. Next slide, please. Uh, animal research professionals also need to be, play a very important role in deciding uh, how vivariums should be designed and constructed. And that's because animals are permanent occupants of these structures and they can't uh, voluntarily evacuate when everyone else leaves. Uh, the other reality is if the building fails and it's deemed unsafe to re-enter following a disaster impact event, then uh, we're forced into a situation where the animals have to be abandoned. And uh, that's very unfortunate. So we're looking at the idea that Viveria should be considered more as essential facilities that are required to maintain uh, a level of function following a disaster impact event. When we talk about uh, fail-safe design, we mean that the building or the engineering systems incorporate components that will mitigate losses caused by system or component failures. And so the design assumption is that when a system failure occurs, for example, if the building loses the ventilation system, water supply, or power, then the building systems are going to fail in a safe manner, and there will be continuing life support uh, for the animals provided. So with that uh, idea in mind, I'm going to turn this over now to Kirk Pulowski. Thank you, Kathy. Consistent with the committee's recommendation number six, um, the report acknowledges the current and critically vulnerable state of research facilities and suggests a way forward for your institution by establishing performance-based standards to ensure research facilities and infrastructure adequately protect people, the scientific team's life's work, and research-related assets. And if I could have the next slide. Uh, the following slides summarize, summarize the uh, committee's call to arms for holistic and comprehensive resilience planning. The committee recommends the creation of, in effect, a new partnership among principal investigators, institutional leadership, administrative support staff, and the community resources and systems surrounding your research enterprise to enhance resilience in the built environment. The committee report includes a framework which will support an institution's efforts to implement resilience planning for the built environment. This framework is based on resilience criteria already initiated by the National Institutes of Health for their own facilities in their 2016 NIH Design Requirements Manual, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, NIST Community Resilience Planning Guide for Buildings and Infrastructure, and the long-serving uh, Department of Veterans Affairs Standard H 1880. Next slide, please. The, the committee's seventh recommendation identifies the critical need for the academic research community to bring all key stakeholders together to develop performance-based standards derived in very large part around the critical continuity and recovery timelines required by the research scientist and his or her teams, and how performance of a resilient built environment is guided by understanding the PI's requirements to preserve and protect discovery research. The committee acknowledges that it is not enough now for the built environment to be simply low impact or carbon smart to be environmentally sustainable. By creating a more resilient built environment, the environment must now have a lower impact on our buildings, our infrastructure, and the research scientists and their missions on behalf of Discovery Research. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. The committee's recommendation number eight addresses the, the critical importance, the long-term nature, and the clear opportunities for academic research institutions to integrate capital and human investments 
which will create enhanced resilience for the research enterprise, funding a resilient mission. <clears throat> Next slide. Considerations for, for creating a financially sustainable research enterprise at your institutions are carefully identified within the study. A number of strategies and tactics are identified on this slide. But in summary, the committee recognized the critical importance of engagement by an institution's financial leadership with all short, mid, and long-range uh, resilience planning activities. Next slide. The committee's recommendation number eight calls on each research institution to develop a financial investment strategy which will represent the business continuity requirements for your research enterprise, the outcome of disaster resilience vulnerability assessments, the short and long range mitigation plans to address those vulnerabilities, but perhaps most important, development of the institution's annual and long range capital plan which identifies the specific investments which promote enhanced resilience for your institution. And I'll now uh, send this back to our committee chair, Dr. Georges Benjamin. Uh, thank you very much, Kirk. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, research sponsors because they certainly play a role um, in all of this. And um, as we look at our, our ninth recommendation, uh, we felt it was important um, to understand um, what um, funders can do uh, to enhance the disaster resilience. You saw the, the point, the slide that Kirk just saw, just showed us uh, about what the institutions themselves can do uh, in, a, in a comprehensive way uh, to think about that. We also felt the funders had a role here. Um, and while we, we certainly can't tell each individual funder what to do or make individual recommendations because they all have different funding guidelines and priorities around what they fund, uh, we do think there's some things that can happen in, in, the, um, in a holistic way. Uh, and so we recommended that the, um, um, the NIH in particular convene a consortium to discuss efforts um, on the financial side in which they can do the, to enhance disaster resilience uh, around the, um, the um, um, the funding of of, uh, of uh, resilience within the context uh, of the mechanism in which they give out money, they hold the institutions accountable uh, for the investment that they have. Um, and, and again, this is we think this is something that is, that is ongoing. Um, we did not define any particular percentage of of dollars that we thought should be set aside for resilience. We did that specifically because um, we're not really able to do that. But with that in mind, it was beyond the scope of the report. Um, but we think this is a good way to get our hands and for the um, um, academic research community and funding community to get their hands around uh, what's most appropriate to move the dial forward around resilience. Uh, and then our final report uh, recommendation um, was to more specifically recognize the academic biomedical research community as a subsector of the healthcare and public health sector specific plan uh, that Homeland Security has in place. And certainly, um, it, it certainly recognizes the health and public health community. Um, but we think that the academic research community, because of the um, critical nature of that um, that sector um, within the public health and healthcare sector, um, that community needs to be thought of through the lens of um, the research community. And so we're recommending that um, this be identified specifically um, as a um, subcategory within the healthcare and public health subsector community. Um, so that we think that it will get a lot more attention as planners begin to um, recognize what we need to do as we go forward. Um, with that, I will um, um, just thank you and just note that we um, the report is on the uh, website of the National Academies. Um, you can see both the full report, there are summary materials, uh, and you'll see the study director, Lisa Brown, who I want to thank her and her staff for their strong support of this study. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, certainly you can um, you can contact Lisa. With that, I will um, turn it over to Donna. We can take questions. <laughs>
Yeah, so we'll now open it up for questions. Please identify yourself and your organization when you submit a question. Um, to start us off, we will start with how does your report address cybersecurity resilience? Well, hi. This is uh, this is uh, George Benjamin. I, you know, um, we we did this as you can see in the context of the whole report has been done in the context of an all hazard approach, um, but we specifically addressed the issue of cybersecurity uh, in our discussion on protection. Um, we recognize this is a core capability for the protection of the academic research institution and the research enterprise. Um, recognizing that cyber attacks can, can span a broad spectrum of um, uh, things that can threaten the critical infrastructure from ransom um, by locking up uh, information to um, destroying um, through technology um, the um, equipment, sabotaging the equipment um, so that you get results that aren't, aren't appropriate. And we know that NIST, um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, has a framework for improving critical infrastructure for cybersecurity. Um, that that um, institute is part of the National Institute of Health, and it sets standards, best practices, and recommendations for improving cybersecurity uh, at the organizational level. And I also know that groups like the American Hospital Association and other health groups are working on on cybersecurity. Um, so with that overview, I also maybe I'll turn over to Alex. And Alex, if you have anything more specific you want to add to that, feel free. Uh, George, I think that's a that's a great overview, and I think um, you know in our in our context of uh, disaster resilience and how it's been described that we would be engaging parties across an academic research institution uh, to realize that disaster resilience. You know, it may be that the chief information officer or the vice president for information technology is already uh, sitting um, on a planning committee or board. Um, as it relates to the um, institution's overall disaster resilience. Uh, I'm sure they have an idea to the protection of their um, their information technology infrastructure. Uh, I, I know, and, and many of you probably also know, that uh, those same experts are engaged in some of the mitigation strategies uh, for the institution. They engage in hazard and vulnerability analyses. Those experts are engaged in business continuity planning and in the enterprise risk management program processes, all mitigation strategies, and clearly are also engaged in um, response and recovery. And so um, for the academic research institution, you know, continued engagement of their senior leadership around information technology is important uh, to protect um, and to mitigate against uh, uh, any type of disaster. And uh, now the committee would, you know, ask that um, that those leaders also turn an eye to the resilience of the disaster. I mean, of of the um, research enterprise as well as the institution broadly, um, to uh, to ensure that those resources are, are protected and the integrity of the data is secure. Thanks for that. Next question is: How should the implementation of your recommendations be paid for? Hi, this is, oh, this is George Benjamin again, and just again to recognize that this is certainly a recognized as a huge challenge for us. Um, you know, we're all struggling day to day to um, find the dollars to um, to maintain the systems that we already have in place. And um, one of the things that we wanted to, to point out in this report, that while there may very well need to be additional investments in one place or another, um, that there can be smart investments. There, there are ways, of course, to use your existing dollars um, as you're beginning to go forward to um, revitalize systems or in your new purchase of technology. Um, there are ways to, to, to strategize around making an adequate investment um, in systems as you go forward. So with that, I also want to turn it over to, um, to, uh, to Kirk, who um, specifically talked about that, those sections of the report. Kirk? Yeah, thanks, thanks, George. Uh, you know, I think for each institution, the idea of one integrated five or 10 or 15 year capital plan that directly supports um, the post-disaster uh, operational uh, objectives identified by the research enterprise and to do it before the disaster occurs is really a very strong underlying uh, 
uh, philosophy, I think that the the committee has identified uh, carefully in the in the report. Uh, it is a long term in, uh, undertaking. I think the the committee also recognizes that by utilizing in the built environment a performance based philosophy uh, that may accept varying levels of damage in a in a post disaster environment. Uh, very clearly recognizes that it is likely cost prohibitive to provide comprehensive protection against all conceivable hazard events. So the the, the fundamental idea I think for us was driven by by the idea of of, of bringing the parties together to to really focus on uh, the post disaster operational objectives for the built environment for the science that's occurring in those that's supported uh, in our built environment. And, and let me and let me add uh, three areas that just to pay some attention to. Um, when Kirk gave you that list of things for the um, for institutions to think about, um, I remind folks that insurance doesn't cover everything, and often there are surprises because obviously the uh, many of the you know, PIs certainly have never seen the institutional insurance policies. So one of the things to think about is what insurance does cover and what do, insurance doesn't cover around the research enterprise itself. Um, secondly, the human resource aspects of it, um, recognizing that, again, um, in some granting situations, if you're on soft money uh, and, in effect, you're now not doing your research, um, you may not be able to be paid. And so thinking about how you cover the salaries of um, researchers, students um, that are paid, research assistants, uh, et cetera, when the institution is no longer um, doing the kind of work that it does uh, is something to plan for. Um, the third thing is to think a bit about, as, as Kirk talked about, the built environment, but I specifically want to point out irreplaceable reagents, tissues, things that have a value that may not have any value in the insurance sense um, because you're not covered under a policy, depending on how that policy is written, but are invaluable to the research enterprise uh, in particular. And this recognizing there is a long tail, even if insurance covers things, to getting that money, um, getting the funds to invest uh, or reinvest in the research enterprise. Um, uh, and as we've looked at some of these um, these events that have happened, uh, it's sometimes taken a long time for even the insurance payout to occur. Thank you for that. Um, our next question comes from William Lawrenson. Um, from a PI standpoint, how are the actions and planning you are you are encouraging captured in the grant funding and reporting aspects? of how they are conducting grant-funded research activities. Um, so basically, how are they funded for the, the training and things like that? Um, Dr. Rock, did you want to take that question? Sure. Did you get that one? Yeah, a pleasure. Well, you know, uh, we have in, in the actual report uh, a summary of our response to Matthew. And uh, really, we've integrated the culture of uh, preparedness uh, throughout the uh, throughout the institution and it's endorsed by the highest levels of re leadership so we have specific planning and as you know planning is everything that actually requires our investigators to uh, have a preparedness checklist uh, for research laboratories. Every laboratory is different. And really, you know, the action is with the individual researcher because they have their own specific needs, their own specific issues. And, uh, you know, addressing this uh, in terms of securing data, for example, uh, really distributing emergency contact lists, uh, uh, autoclaving and then activating infectious waste if you if if you have that issue and the list goes on but it's well planned out and really part of the culture of the institution to protect their investment and obviously the the investment of the of the grantor uh so this uh this is supported by the institution and financially supported by the institution as well uh, as i stressed before the individual investigator is paramount in this whole process. 
And and I and I my I add this is George Benjamin again just to add the the fact that as as again when you're when you're living on soft money you have to plan for what happens um, from both a salary perspective or a resource perspective should those soft money dollars not be able to use under normal accounting and auditing principles. Um, because that research has been put aside, and those are some of the things that we're hoping the funders will begin to think about when, if they're able to convene and think about how they address this uh, when disaster strikes, um, utilizing their dollars. And this is Dana again. We've gotten a couple questions about, so that short URL, nationalacademies.org forward slash disaster resilient labs, um, we're having some issues with that working, but um, you can access the full report and all those other materials, including the slides later this week, and then, you know, the recording of this at a longer URL that was posted by Ann Winya in the Q&A box um, in, in WebEx, so um, just wanted to mention that. Moving on, um, how has, or has the committee considered adding those items deemed mandatory to the grant award requirements? I, I can tell you that the committee did talk about the idea of um, mandatory activities and we felt that we were not the best to do that. As we looked at the evidence, there really isn't a lot of evidence about yet for what's best. And as you know, we try to make these reports as evidence-based as we can. However, um, we certainly, um, in our discussions with the sponsor, um, the major sponsor at the NIH and, uh, and, and others, we talked about the importance of them thinking that kind of concept through as they go forward. Um, in their grant making, and again, we hope that if a meeting is pulled together around study sponsors, that those kinds of um, recommendations, uh, whether they be requirements or requirements of the grant or of the funding you know, of, of the grant, or that simply a funder decides that we want to see a plan to tell, tell us, the funder, how you're going to address that. Um, may very well serve as a um, um, a way to achieve that same goal um, versus a versus a mandatory requirement. Thank you. Um, and also, can the committee comment on the research on previous events related to how universities accessed resources during disasters? In many cases, universities often are deemed less essential for resource allocation and find it difficult to obtain resources. Um, this is George Benjamin. And yes, of course, we, we, we discussed that. Um, I, I show you that, uh, and then I'll turn it over to um, both Alex and to John um, to maybe comment more specifically. But one of, our, our, one of the reasons we did the site visit to um, NYU um, was to look and see what they did and around that and how they made decisions around resource allocation. Um, and one thing I pointed, I may, have, I think I said this earlier, but I'll point out that they, um, they basically chose to um, to cover the salaries of the, their research personnel um, um, out of their dollars pending. Um, reconciliation of other dollars because they needed to do that to maintain um, those staff in place and make sure they didn't leave their jobs and go elsewhere. Um, they've also prioritized some of their capital dollars and in, in redesigned some of the, the realigned some of the funding in their capital plan <coughs> to address some of the some of the risk from flooding, um, recognizing that while that was a you know a hundred year event. Hurricane Sandy. It was a it was a big event that wiped out major parts of their academic health center, and they pointed out the fact that how critical um, the integrated system was. Um, and while part of the reason for our report is to point out that while you may think the academic research center is a, is a second tier function, um, when you actually pull back the onion skin, so to speak, you find that it's essential to a whole range. Of activities um, in the um, um, at the university or um, the the hospital academic center, 
um, and it's much more valuable than people often think um, until they actually look at it. Um, John, would you like to comment? Uh, yes, I think also that, uh, you know, we discussed a lot about uh, New York's ability to respond because they planned ahead and had a reserve fund that was that they could draw dollars for uh, for faculty and for other needed supplies and materials. Uh, and I think that has to be considered by uh, by the planning effort and, and universities and research institutions. Is there a way to mitigate uh, the financial stress that inevitably occurs with a major disaster? And can it be shared across the entire university to uh, develop those kinds of funds that would be available? And, and Alex, did you have anything to add? Yeah, you know, I'll just compliment what uh, you both uh, said in response to the question uh, by emphasizing again, you know, the importance of the relationship uh, between the academic uh, research institution and its uh, local emergency management agency uh, and its state emergency management agency. It's really through that dialogue uh, and through some mutual understanding about what the needs are at the academic research institution. And as George's, as you'd mentioned, sometimes the academic research institution is um, uh, closely uh, tied to uh, an academic health center. And as a health center, uh, there's a uh, recognition that that is a, actually a critical infrastructure resource, um, but uh, which would uh, allow it to get uh, more ready access to some uh, resources in you know, the immediate aftermath of a disaster. Uh, for a response. But, but that relationship, that dialogue that's had between uh, the academic institution, its local partners, both in the government sector and in the private sector, that probably goes to state and uh, federal uh, functions as well, is really key to accessing the resources when they are in short supply. And as the question uh, implies, uh, when an academic research institution might be deemed less essential for these um, uh, resources that are in short supply, the relationship will allow the uh, communication that's necessary to access those resources and, uh, and contribute to the resilience of the institution. Uh, that very much complements the activity that the institution is, is making to be more self-reliant and dis disaster resilient in those uh, circumstances. Thank you. Our next question is, how should the academic biomedical research community get involved in the healthcare and public health critical infrastructure sector? Um, George Benjamin again, I, I think uh, recognizing first to do that locally within your own institution and, and uh, to reach out and be part of that emergency management process. Um, is very important because this is that's a a construct that is very much um, part of the um, the emergency management function. Um, we always often say that um, a disaster is not the time to begin exchanging business cards, so this really has to be done up front. Uh, at the federal level, we hope that the the, um, the federal government will recognize the importance of pulling that out simply on paper and recognizing that. Uh, as part of that process, that that will create a dialogue on on how to make that a um, an essential component of what the expectations are at the federal level. But for those of you who have um, state-based or large city-based disaster plans, to pull out the academic research um, enterprise um, and and however it's defined within your disaster plans, to pull it out. Um, not necessarily separate, but be a major component uh, of the um, health and public health um, sector planning effort. Um, so that, as you know, as you know, when you do these planning efforts, you look through them through various lenses, and one of those lenses ought to be the academic research um, lens itself. Uh, this is John Rock. You know, I, I think that's an incredibly important point. And, and the chief resilience officer, the CRO, as I mentioned before, has a clear understanding of the research enterprise and is part of the enterprise uh, planning community, really can interface and identify and communicate the essential critical infrastructure that's needed by the research enterprise and outline uh, how that can be uh, how that can be uh, aligned with the uh, institutional management 
emergency management program. So to, to that question is a critical one and extremely important in, in the planning effort. And uh, John and George's, if I can, I'll, I'll add that at, at a federal level, um, you know, the committee uh, looked at the uh, at critical infrastructure security. It looked at the sector-specific plan as it related to healthcare and, and, pu and the public health sector. And while there was mention of research and, and laboratory capability, you know, in that sector-specific plan, uh, I think the committee believed that. Uh, that trying to specifically uh, identify the academic research community um, in that uh, sector-specific plan will really help start the dialogue that's necessary at the federal level too uh, to identify resources and to uh, perhaps you know, promulgate best practices. Uh, through dialogue that happens in what are recognized or called sector coordinating councils, where I think the academic research community can be represented by our uh, professional or, or trade associations engaging uh, government partners uh, in the lead for uh, healthcare and public health sector, which is Department of Health and Human Services. But of course, um, uh, in complementing that sector coordinating council as a government coordinating council, uh, which is led by the Department of Homeland Security that will interact with the, the Secretary for Health and Human Services and, and be informed, I think, also by uh, some of the sponsors uh, for this report, uh, particularly NIH, who um, you know, has a, 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 an interest, as we all do, in protecting that $27 billion a year investment, as well as the capabilities that that research uh, community afford the nation and its national security with regards to research related to biohazards, chemical hazards, radiological hazards, response to nuclear uh, detonation. Um, you know, these are important research capabilities that are uh, really underpinning the national security uh, of our nation. And, um, and, and that's why the committee felt strongly about distinctly recognizing the academic research community in the um, sector-specific plans as it relates to critical infrastructure. Thank you for that. Our, what I think will be our last question is, um, can you tell us what fail-safe design criteria for animal research facilities would entail? I'm going to, this is George Bigger, I'm going to first go to um, Kirk and then to Kathy. Yeah, thanks, George. Uh, you know, I think the, the, the discussions that were that, uh, among the committee uh, uh, members uh, th throughout this uh, uh, issue, uh, specific to this issue of of fail safe is, go, at the heart goes to the idea of, uh, uh, that is enshrined in our uniform building codes in North America, which is an essential facility, uh, a, a facility that um, uh, is typically characterized as a, as a hospital, uh, uh, an acute care hospital, our, our fire, our police stations, and other very essential uh, components of the built environment that we rely upon. Uh, in the event of uh, minor or major disasters, uh, the 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 discussion really about animals is very much uh, the sense that they are not capable of self-preservation. Very very similar to uh, humans' conditions that we would see in an acute care hospital, where uh, patients are not uh, able to rescue themselves without assistance. So I think you know underpinning the fail-safe concept is the idea of sustaining life, um, and uh, for uh, animals uh, who are not able to protect themselves uh, or sustain themselves, but also recognizing concurrent with that the absolute critical role that uh, that uh, that we still see in the in the role of uh, core research capabilities that these uh, the, the, that these uh, functions provide to the to discovery research. So, with that uh, general comment, I'll, I'll ask. Kathy to perhaps share uh, you know her perspective on the importance of failsafe. Yeah, thank you, Kirk. Um, one thing that I think is important is that I think that research buildings typically, following uh, international building code design, you know, are just uh, not meant to be very functional after a disaster hits. If there's a if there's an impact event that takes out that damages that building. You know, 
if the area in that building where those animals are residing sustains significant damage, then people are not going to be allowed to go back in. And so I think that there's been somewhat of a lack of appreciation uh, of the reality that those animals are permanent occupants of that structure. And so the committee's uh, thoughts were that they should be considered more along the lines of patients in an acute care facility that, that cannot voluntarily leave. So, Kirk, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think the specifics of failsafe uh, go, you know, in, in terms of the the built environment for animal care research is a very complex discussion. But the idea of continu continuing specifically to support with water resources, <clears throat> with thermal comfort, uh, and uh, to mitigate uh, impacts, negative impacts to the populations that are being cared for by laboratory veterinarians is really at the heart of the failsafe idea. Well, thanks everyone. It looks like those are all the questions we have time for today. Once you exit this webinar, you will be directed to our report page, which is now working again. It's www.nationalacademies.org forward slash disaster resilient labs. The slides from today's webinar will be posted on that page tomorrow, and a recording of this webinar will, will be available sometime next week. And with that, I'd like to thank all of our speakers and thank you all again for participating.